All right, we're going to be talking about traumatic brain injury. I have no financial disclosures. I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. We're going to divide this talk up into several sections. We're first going to discuss who needs to have brain imaging after a brain or head trauma. We'll talk about what type of imaging is needed. And then we'll discuss the kinds of lesions that will be identified, beginning with extraaxial lesions and then talking about intraaxial lesions. In talking about traumatic brain injury, you have to understand that we have a very heterogeneous clinical population. The sequela and pathophysiology of the sequela of traumatic brain injury are very, very diverse and complex. We have to understand that closed head injury can be produced without penetrating the skin. That can be from a blast wave, and we can also talk about penetrating injury, which is not the subject of this uh, discussion. The pathoanatomic assessment, which is what we do as radiologists, is very, very complex, and we have to all remember that lesions can change and evolve over time, so that what we see on today's imaging may just be a snapshot in time of the evolution of the disease process. In 2002, the CDC reported that over 50,000 Americans die each year from traumatic brain injury, and about a third of those are from motor vehicle accidents, about 10% from falls, and I was surprised to learn that a significant number of patients, about 20,000, die from penetrating uh, wounds caused by firearms. So most commonly when we discuss traumatic brain injury, we're really talking about motor vehicle accidents and falls from a height. In the classification of TBI, we typically use the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a very crude predictor of the patient outcome. We have to understand that the Glasgow Coma Scale doesn't really work well in patients who are alert and cooperative, and it is not a good way to stratify patients who fall in a range between uh, about 13 and 15, and some people say even as low as a 6 on the Glasgow Coma Scale. It's a very easy test to perform, and it is universally used, but it is not a good predictor of the ultimate outcome of traumatic brain injury. We have to also distinguish between impact and inertial injuries. It's easy to understand how a direct blow to the head or the skull can damage the underlying brain, but we must remember that inertial forces, like an acceleration or deceleration, even of a restrained occupant of a motor vehicle, can damage the underlying brain and yet not produce any lesions visible on the outside. Primary brain lesions, which are difficult to see on acutely performed computed tomography, are classically associated with an immediate neurologic deficit. And these are primarily bruises in the brains or contusions and what we'll call the deep lesions or shearing injuries. Secondary brain lesions, which are usually visible on CT, have a variable delay between the TBI and the signs and symptoms, and these include expanding hematomas in the epidural space, the subdural space, the parenchyma of the brain, and they may damage the brain secondarily by causing mass effect, increased intracranial pressure, and brain herniation. In addition, patients may have problems with vasoreactivity to include vasospasm as well as hyperemic brain swelling, and the patients may end up having secondary sequela of brain infarction. The secondary lesions are classically the patients who are uh, awake or uh, wandering confused around the accident scene and may have a delayed neurologic sequela, and these are the classic talk and die patients. We can put these into a matrix, and you can see the different patterns of injury are associated with the impact versus inertial forces. Uh, it was Donald Rumsfeld who reminded us that there are known knowns, but there are also unknown unknowns, and we have to consider that we are just beginning to understand the full spectrum of traumatic brain injury. In any particular patient, we may have an overlap between a variety of different lesions that are the sequela of TBI, and as far as we understand right now, these lesions may be treated quite differently uh, even when they do overlap. We have to also realize that mild TBI has a variety of definitions that are undergoing an evolution of their own. Patients who have mild TBI or what we used to call concussion typically do not get neuroimaging done. When they do have imaging done, the CT scan is typically normal in about 85% of patients. This doesn't mean that they do not have structural or parenchymal lesions, but the lesions are below the threshold of detectability on computed tomography. To fully understand traumatic brain injury, we have to consider using more sensitive tests. We have to consider that more patients need to have imaging screening than we currently study. 
And we need also to consider doing follow-up examinations on a larger percentage of patients. We're going to divide this talk up into sections. We're going to talk about who needs imaging. We're going to talk about patients that have lesions involving the skull and the scalp and the epidural space. We'll talk about subdural hematomas. We'll talk about brain bruising or contusions. And we'll finish up at the end about talking about sub uh, cortical lesions like shearing injuries, and these are lesions classically that may be associated with patients going into coma or persistent vegetative state. There is a robust imaging portfolio available to us, but the mainstay of imaging traumatic brain injury is still computed tomography. We have to recognize and accept the added sensitivity of magnetic resonance imaging, especially with new techniques such as diffusion tensor imaging and tractography, the use of magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and also functional MRI that may identify uh, lesions in the brain from a functional perspective that may not have obvious anatomic localization. Let's now talk about our first educational objective, who needs brain imaging? The clinical diagnosis of head trauma in the past has been based on rising blood pressure, slowing pulse, and slowing respirations, all signs of increased intracranial pressure. And this has been described as Cushing's triad. We also know that patients who have an acute neurologic emergency associated with an accident or event, patients who are in coma who may be unconscious or unresponsive, and patients who have an abnormal fundoscopic examination, either demonstrating paralysis of the extraocular muscles or a dilated pupil indicating a problem with the third cranial nerve. Let's take a practical clinical case. This is an accident that occurred in a motor vehicle driving from Prague to Vienna in June 2004. These happy campers here, my wife and my daughter, are deliriously happy because they weren't killed. The vehicle was no longer operable and all of the windows and doors were broken. So this was a nine-passenger van. Everyone was belted in. We experienced a hydroplaning problem, a 180-degree horizontal turn, and a two-and-a-half barrel rollover. Nobody blacked out, and everyone walked away. Everyone has a clear memory of seeing the horizon flip over two-and-a-half times looking out the window. Should we have been scanned? Well, there's lots of criteria for determining who needs to be scanned and also some good exclusionary criteria for people who may not need emergent imaging. An article that was published by the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000 indicated that CT could be safely limited to patients who have headache, seizures, or vomiting after a traumatic event, age over the age of 60, Patients who are difficult to evaluate and follow clinically, patients who have drug or ethanol intoxication, and patients who have signs of physical trauma above the clavicles. We could reduce these to a simpler set of indications for imaging. Patients who have an acute neurologic deficit, patients who have a loss of consciousness observed by a second party, patients who have a persistent headache after trauma, patients who have experienced severe trauma, and patients who have an obvious injury. And if you read through the criteria as they are reevaluated and republished year after year, they all tend to revolve around these five themes. We have to understand that we currently only image patients that have relatively severe levels of traumatic brain injury and that mild TBI or concussion is usually not imaged. And when we do image those patients, 85% of them are normal by CT. And that is probably not because they are normal, but because CT is a relatively insensitive test for mild traumatic brain injury. And that has to be kept in context in considering how we should study these patients. So CT continues to be good for triaging the patient, but CT is really not enough. And we would also like to add to the indications published in the New England Journal that patients who have post-traumatic amnesia that lasts for more than 20 or 30 minutes patients who have loss of first cranial nerve function or anosmia, and patients who have ruptured tympanic membranes, which may be an indicator of a blast overpressure wave, those patients should also be studied, at least with computed tomography, if not with more advanced imaging techniques. What we do know about TBI includes scalp lesions that we can see on the outside, skull fractures that we've seen on skull films and can see easily on computed tomography, extra axial hemorrhage and hematomas in the 
potential epidural space, subdural space, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, and intraaxial hemorrhage, brain bruising, or cerebral contusions. What type of imaging should we be using, both in the acute setting in the emergency department and as a full evaluation of patients with TBI? Skull films, which have been the standard up until the late 1980s, are perfectly reasonable ways to identify metallic foreign bodies, intracranial air, skull fractures, etc., as in this patient with an obvious uh, penetrating bullet fragment injury. If we go back into history, we also know that we would be able to determine the presence of large intracranial shifts and herniation by recognizing displacement of normally calcified structures, such as the pineal gland seen here in the lateral radiograph and also in the frontal film. And on the frontal film, we can see that the pineal gland is displaced from the midline by approximately uh, 10 millimeters. So this patient must have subthalsal brain herniation in order to produce this imaging appearance. Since the early 1980s, all level one trauma centers have had uh, CT available 24 by 7, and it's very, very good for triaging patients. Again, we can very easily identify that there is scalp swelling, that there is a metallic density here, which is a ball bearing. We can do fancy 3D reconstructions to identify that we have the ball bearing impacted on the skull over here. But we may also take advantage of cross-sectional imaging and identifying the track of the wound through the patient, and this patient with a penetrating fragment injury. So times have changed. In 1980, CT replaced the skull series. In 2000, MR began to complement CT, but it has not really replaced CT as a screening exam. And in 2010 and going into the future, we may identify that specialized MR techniques have greater sensitivity and greater specificity in identifying the sequela of traumatic brain injury. And we may end up using those as our primary imaging techniques in the future. There's a hierarchy of sensitivity of different imaging techniques, but still the mainstay is computed tomography, standard MR with flare pulse sequences, and it's always important to add some kind of a technique that takes advantage of magnetic susceptibility change that may be associated with intracranial hemorrhage. So CT is good for triage, but CT is probably not sufficient uh, for the majority of patients that have had traumatic brain injury. What then might be reasons for getting an MR after obtaining a CT scan? Well, reason number one is the CT fails to explain the patient's neurologic status, and reason number two is the CT fails to explain the patient's status, and reason number three is that the CT fails to explain the patient's condition. We must accept and understand that a negative CT scan doesn't mean that there is nothing going on with the patient. It just means there's nothing going on that is within the realm of sensitivity and the threshold detection by computed tomography. It's also been suggested that patients who have polytrauma and are hospitalized would need further evaluation with an MR image even after an initial screening CT scan. MR techniques can vary. We have standard T2 weighted imaging. We can do diffusion weighted imaging, traditionally part of our stroke evaluation protocol. And if you do a imaging technique, either a gradient or a specialized susceptibility weighted image, we can identify small areas of hemorrhage that are really invisible and unnoticed on the T2 and the standard diffusion weighted imaging. Very, very important in staging these patients.